Last month, a Pew Research study found that 73% of adults now use social networking sites. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are the new tools of our professional and personal lives. We use them to get information, to stay connected to friends, to connect with those who share our interests, and sometimes just to kill time while waiting in line. Our virtual lives are an important part of our real lives. The places where we work and learn and play and relax are increasingly mediated and affected by our online selves. Behind the avatars and the 140 characters are flesh and blood people. That means that what happens online matters and what is happening to women online should give us pause. According to the volunteer organization working to halt online abuse, of the nearly 4,000 people reporting online stalking and harassment from 2000 to 2012, 72.5% were women. The harassment of women and what is being done and not done to stop it is the subject of the cover story of the current issue of Pacific Standard Magazine entitled, Why Women Aren't Welcome on the Internet. The author, Amanda Hess, is herself a victim of online stalking and harassment. And her article includes, or maybe a survivor of it, her article includes several of the specific attacks that she has received via social media. They are so gruesome and so vulgar that I'm not going to read them verbatim here, but they include threats of sexual assault and murder. Amanda writes, no matter how hard we attempt to ignore it, this type of gendered harassment and the sheer volume of it has severe implications for women's status on the Internet. Threats of rape, death and stalking can overpower our emotional bandwidth, take up our time and cost us money through legal fees, online protection services and missed wages. Joining me today is Amanda Hess, contributor to Pacific Standard, also here Anthea Butler, professor of religious studies and graduate chair of religion at the University of Pennsylvania, Nancy Giles, contributor to CBS Sunday Morning, feminist editor and guardian, columnist Jill Filipovich, and from San Francisco, Elon James White, managing director and host of This Week in Blackness. So happy to have you all here. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to me about this article and the response it's been getting. Um, so I wrote this article after I received my most recent sort of bout of threats this past summer. Uh, and the threats were obviously distressing. It was an anonymous person on Twitter threatening to come to my house, to rape me, to cut off my head. And in one, you know, on the one hand, that's a completely ludicrous thing to say, and that's, you know, probably not going to happen. But on the other hand, it's so confusing uh, when you receive threats like that because people are telling you, don't worry about it, it's just the internet, it's not going to happen. Others are saying it's your responsibility to track this person down and to prosecute them. And some people are saying, if it's so bad, then why don't you just quit Twitter? <laughs> yeah. uh, and so the threats are bad. What's really confusing, though, is is how, as a person, you're supposed to deal with them. Yeah, we, you know, we were just talking about the gauntlet that women have to walk in order to, um, to receive termination services um, for pregnancy. And these are the gauntlets that you have to walk just to log on to the Internet, right? And that does feel to me, in part, like we have to keep making the claim that what occurs online matters in the real world like as even as we were trying to think of this segment I kept thinking there just are going to be people who feel like well just turn that off don't go over there stop stop going over there in virtual world because that world doesn't matter why does it matter well I think a big disconnect is exactly what you're saying and what Amanda's piece highlighted is that there is a sense I think especially among law enforcement and in US laws that what happens on the internet is some sort of virtual reality mm -hmm. whereas increasingly we live our lives online we see photos of our friends' babies on Facebook. We interact on Twitter. I initially met Amanda online yep. through feminist blogging. You know, I followed you on Twitter before I ever you know, came on your show or exactly. met you. Um, so we increasingly network online. You know, my career is writing online. I don't write for a newspaper. I write for a blog and for The Guardian's website. Um, you can't tell us to just get off the Internet. Yeah. And when you have people coming into your online spaces, coming at you on Twitter, in comments on your blogs, you know, and essentially telling you you deserve to be sexually assaulted or even killed for what you're saying, that's just as intimidating as, you know, walking through a hallway at work yep. and having somebody, you know, hiss at you through a doorway that you should be, you know, raped or killed. And I think that's 
what people don't necessarily fully appreciate about the lives that women live and what we receive online in terms of harassment. Jill, your, your point is, is um, about us knowing one another initially virtually is also true of my friendship with Elon. Uh, I mean, Elon, you and I became, you know, actual sort of friends, colleagues, following one another's work all in the virtual world before actually getting to know one another. And, I, you know, I was saying to my Nerdland team, I was like, that part of my life is over. It is so ugly in that world now that I just can't engage in the ways that I initially engaged in social media that, in fact, led to valuable, you know, um, professional relationships because it is so ugly there. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how then you can begin to navigate something that is that ugly. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, especially with what, what we are seeing right now with how women are spoken to. And the fact is, like, even when people say, like, when that, that, that whole thing about, uh, oh, just don't be there, it's like, that's, it's a terrible idea because... Like for me personally, my entire career right now is based on the uh, on the social media uh, platforms that I've I've been using that I've used for my company for the relationships I've used, mm -hmm. and so basically you're telling women you're not allowed to have that opportunity, right? Exactly. Um, and it's it's unfair, it's uh, it's unreasonable, and when people say that, it's literally just ignoring the reality of the world that we're currently living in. And so to actually try to navigate those things, a lot of people do things uh, for their own mental health, yeah. like blocking people in a heartbeat, just like no, but ju that's just that's not sometimes enough because if mm -hmm. you're going into an environment and you just know that when you go into that environment you're going to be abused whether it be yep. quote unquote fake or not fake it's still abuse and you don't want to do it heck I, there's days I don't want to log on to Twitter let alone <laughs> yeah. if someone was uh, threatening to rape me yep yep absolutely mm -hmm. uh, uh, Anthea you have you have tweeted pretty um, honestly and openly about how these cyber bullies jump off the page, jump off the 140 characters or the Facebook or the blog comments and show up in your real life. That it is, it is part of the um, active attempts to destroy people's credibility, their capacity to have jobs, right? That these have very real consequences. Yes, they do. Um, I can say to you that, um, and you know this and a lot of other academics know this, that once you say something that somebody doesn't like, they start calling the offices, they call your provost's office, they call your dean's office. We want to get them off, we want to shut them up. We want to do all kinds of things. But what they don't seem to understand is that we are real, live people. Like, if they walked up to me and wanted to say this to my face, I'm like, come on. Mm -hmm. Because basically, I'm like, I dare you. Because I bet you won't say it to my face, first of all. And second of all, the Penn University police will not let you get that close mm -hmm. to me. Okay, so that's, that's part of it. But the other part of it is that sometimes this is very coordinated. And I think one of the things we have to talk about are how other bloggers, other tweeters, other people who are active in social media actually attack other people and there are sites and we all know this one by um, somebody who just got sold to Salem Communications and everybody knows who that is who send people to come and attack you mm. when they don't like what they do so these are coordinated attacks these are not just the random guy sitting around his boxer shorts saying I hate this woman mm -hmm. but they are they are also coordinated they are paid for mm -hmm. there are people who say let's go do this to this person because we want mm -hmm. to take them down mm -hmm. and so what I want people to understand especially Twitter to understand is that this service that was so great to it three years ago is now a cesspool of crap. And it's so hard to use this the way that we used to be able to use it yeah. to talk and to oh, do things. Right, right, right. So, so I do want to, I do want to be careful that like this isn't this isn't exclusively a Twitter issue, no, it's right? All over. Right. It's all and, over. and 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 that part of I think um, as we come back we'll talk a little bit about solutions in part because again I met Jill on Twitter, I met Elon on Twitter, and not only that, but um, in a world where there is so much information, I use the signaling effort of you know like I, I want to follow people I disagree with, I want to follow people I agree with because it's valuable to me to get. Oh. To get that information. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about what solutions look like and whether or not we can redeem the value, right, all the, the, the positive values in this context. We're back and talking about the Pacific Standard article, why women aren't uh, aren't welcome on the internet and sort of all the questions about online harassment that it raises. Nancy, I want to get you in here. Well, you know, it's so funny. I mean, among other things, I'm a woman. I love being a woman. It's hard being a woman. It is just hard, all right? And and CBS pays me because they value my opinions, which is lovely. And you mm -hmm. have me on for the same reason. If your opinion isn't something that matches up with people, I'll say men for the most part, because I can't believe other women are saying the kind of things back at us. The kind mm -hmm. of sexual, violent imagery, the kind of attacking on how you look, how you smell, these really vicious things that just 
are exponentially over the top and beyond the pale. It, it's fascinating. As a woman, I wouldn't say something like that to a man that I disagreed with, but the vitriol, it's just, it's astounding. Yep. It's just, it's shocking. And, and, and Amanda, I've, I've found um, when, when those moments happen and you're suddenly being attacked, sometimes it's, it's the one person who is obsessing over you and then you're just getting that. But sometimes it's also um, kind of broader sort of tidal waves of it. And I find it to be very triggering. I find that sense of, um, that, w that what we are told to do is what rape survivors are often told to do, which is don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Because if you say anything, right, if you push back, then you are um, at risk for greater violence and um, you are at risk that the people you care and love about will be violated as well. So if people jump to your defense, then they too will, get, and, and so you just feel like, oh God, I'm gonna go in this corner and hide. And that is that, is that emotion of assault and of survival. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, sort of the paradox of writing the story to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the sort of important things I think to come out of this is that it should not be a problem that women are dealing with on their own, mm -hmm. that there are legal institutions and there are technology companies that really sort of have a responsibility to make our communities safe for women. Is this a Title VII employment um, discrimination issue? I think it is. Um, you know, the internet is where many people work. It's where we socialize. And when women are so unwelcome and so harassed out of these spaces, it has a real impact on our livelihoods and our lives. I mean, you know, it's it is you know very comparable to not letting having you know not letting have not letting someone have a seat you know at the diner mm -hmm. even though it's a private institution mm -hmm. you know or not letting women into the workplace even though it might be you know a, a private company mm -hmm. um, these things it is gender discrimination um, and it's very very harmful so Elon help me to think through this for a second because it, it feels to me like one possibility are a set of new policies regulations and laws but part of what we love about the internet is its relative freedom it's, it's, a, it's a kind of libertarian space but I also worry about just turning the turning the rules of that space back on itself. So like getting other kinds of gang violence, you know, online to mess with the gang violence that is occurring like that also feels um, unproductive to me. Are there ways to, to protect the liberty, protect, you know, questions of, of levels of anonymity that we care about, but also somehow make this space safer for people to engage? Uh, I believe so, and the fact is that the companies, the big tech companies, have to take into consideration what people need for their own safety. Like, for example, with uh, uh, Google Plus, they weren't they weren't allowing people to have an account without have, unless they put their real name, not acknowledging the fact that you know what, some people don't want their real name out there because they don't want those attacks to uh, to possibly become real. The tech companies have to actually start to look at how this is happening, what what's happening, and try to implement uh, certain types of uh, 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 solutions that can actually allow for conversation because no one doesn't want conversation. Because mm -hmm. that's the first thing that people want. to like, oh, yeah. you just want to stop uh, uh, free speech. You're like, no, everyone wants uh, free speech. But yeah. you know what? You got to see what's being said. Right. And we're talking like uh, uh, around uh, women, and especially, let's uh, uh, be honest here, around women of color, they get oh. the double dose of mm -hmm. uh, sexism and racism at the exact same time. Yep. Uh, so they, they have to take the, those things into consideration and not uh, uh, just completely shut everything off, but constantly, constantly be looking for new and interesting ways that can allow for the conversation to happen but at the same time, keep people safe. Yeah, with just 15 seconds left here, Amanda, I do want to point out you made such a strong point that there is, um, that that anonymity question, often women who make their lives in public space are not anonymous online. Our actual names and jobs and places and where we work and often where we live are available, but the, but the folks who are doing the stalking or the harassing are quite anonymous. And it feels like there's got to be something we can do to change that imbalance. Right. I mean, one of the problems is that, you know, the people are, who are saying the Internet isn't real, it's very easy to say that if you're hiding in your basement threatening people. It's easy to say that if you're a police officer who doesn't want to take a report. It's a lot harder to say that if you're a woman just trying to do her job on the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's difficult to know how to approach that. On the one hand, you know, police officers um, don't have a lot of resources, resources or education. Technology companies have all the resources in the world. And I think the problem that you're seeing in both of those places is that they're extremely male dominated. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we look to tech companies to innovate, uh, to sort of bring us things that we never could have imagined. Yeah. And so I think we can ask them to sort of bring us solutions on this problem as well. Right, to, to address this asymmetry with the resources and, and, and intelligence and innovation that they have. Right. Amanda Hess, Anthea Butler, Nancy Giles, Jill Filipovich, and Elon James White, who of course joined us virtually just to prove the point that virtual <laughs> relationships <laughs> exist. Up next, we're going to make a happy moment at the end of this show, the 12-year-old bow tie mo.